Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Dr. Jose Ramon Fernandez-Pena, president of the American Public Health Association and director of health professions advising at Northwestern University. They discuss what it's like to be a college student during COVID-19 and the deeper understanding about public health he's seeing in the undergrads he serves today. Let's listen. Jose Ramon Fernandez-Pena, thanks so much for joining me. Very nice to be here. I wanted to talk to you sort of about both of your jobs today. Um, I I know that you do uh, counseling for uh, undergrads who are interested in health professions. And I wanted to hear about how things may be different during the pandemic. Well, there's many ways in which the pandemic affects uh, our students who are interested in, all students, but of course we work with students who are interested in health professions, primarily medicine, but also other sorts of health professions. Certainly, many of our students look for volunteer opportunities, internship opportunities, and those have been pretty much removed from the list of options available to them. So that's something that has them worried. And as many of them begin the process of applying to medical school, for example, they are concerned on whether not having enough shadowing hours or not having a broad lab research experience because some of the labs have been closed as well during this time is going to negatively impact their in their application process. We also have the personal aspect and how COVID-19 has affected communities in terms of loss of housing, loss of employment, loss of income. And students are, of course, affected by these things. Their parents may have lost a job. Their mother may have passed from COVID. They may also live in circumstances where a student and all their family are working remotely or going to school remotely. And maybe they have one laptop in the home. And maybe they have a not very stable internet. So in order to attend classes, it it becomes challenging in many ways, shapes, and forms. Some students uh, that were not able to return to campus uh, may be in housing situations that are not best for them. Tensions may be arising. We've seen that during COVID, the need for mental health services has been exponentially high and the services are not readily available. So there's been issues of domestic violence or people who are in, um, in need of services for substance use or addiction services have not been able to access those services. And of course, this triggers a series of of effects in the entire environment of the student. We have not seen an uptick in the number of students uh, declaring or saying we don't have a pre-med track, we have uh, just undergraduates and we assign the designation pre-med when they come seek our services. But we are not seeing more students seeking our services in any for any health profession. We may see a few more here and there that are interested in pursuing a career in public health. What we do see is that students appear to be much more aware of the intersection between public health and medicine. So we hear our students during mock interviews or in conversations talking about the importance of access to health services, the importance of diversity in the health workforce, the importance of uh, understanding the context in which health and disease happens. They are talking about the uneven distribution of the burden of disease in ways that were not as obvious before for the average pre-med student or pre-health student. And I think that this is wonderful, that this awareness is increasing and the kind of programming that we're doing, for example, in my office is also picking up on those things and trying to bring those things forth. We just had an event on racism and a pandemic, for example, and we had individuals from Latino, African-American, Asian, and Native American communities talk about how these communities have been differently impacted than white communities. So that's one side of my life. The other side of my life in, in public health 
speaking with colleagues across the country, I do hear that there seems to be a higher number of students applying to medical, I mean, to public health programs, MPH programs. One thing that I think is kind of an interesting observation, the, the, the notion that suddenly we have many more students applying to medical school is really not even feasible because in order to apply to medical school, there has to be a, a number of years behind that MCAT taking. So if we are to see that so-called Fauci effect, we will probably see it three years from now or four years from now. But you are seeing a different type of student, a different type of question being asked by these students. I w- I like to think that it's a more mature look at what their future looks like. So it's not, oh, I'm going to study medicine, I'm going to go to medical school, and then I'm going to cure cancer. So I hear a, a deeper awareness of many layers on uh, the health of communities. I mean, this has been such an expose for everybody to see the inadequacy of health services in the United States that it's been an eye-opener for those who weren't aware of how things, uh, how race, how class, how zip code, how many other layers impact health outcomes. And I think that students are picking up on those differences and integrating them into their thinking process and in their, why do I want to get into this field, which is uh, perhaps a more solid foundation to work on. As someone who's been in public health for a while myself, I feel like there's a greater understanding of what public health is now than there was before. For sure, for sure. Still, we we know we're the bad news people in public health. I think we're the ones that tell you, don't do this, don't do that. <laughs> and I own that, and I'm very proud of that job that we do. But uh, the appreciation for the work of public health and the fact that everybody's talking about public health. We have to follow public health guidelines. We have to follow public health evidence-based principles. So yes, I think, I mean, there's never a silver lining in anything like a pandemic, but I think that uh, people are getting a much better sense of what we do. And it's not just putting vaccines in people. It's certainly many more things than, and there's a deeper realization of the importance of public health in policy, public health in education, public health in in the overall way of living. And you touched on this a little bit, but I'm thinking about these undergrad students. Do they, um, is there a real sense that they're missing out on sort of life? I mean, their college is supposed to be a time of of so many things and sitting at home and thinking about a pandemic is really not what we hoped for them. Yes, I think this is a uniquely American phenomenon, this notion that it's only you are 18 and you go away to college somewhere different than where you live. This was certainly not my experience growing up in Mexico or in most parts of the world. You don't leave home until you get married, probably. But uh, certainly this opportunity to go out into the world and to experience and to do all these things. And many of these students have spent their last year of high school at home. Right. So they didn't have that last year of high school. They didn't have that prom and then they didn't go to college and they didn't get to sleep in the dorms and all those things. And they're missing that uh, that interaction or that stage of development or or that set of expectations of their own life. They're also missing on a series of uh, important developmental skills, I think, and uh, also in their professional development, they're not getting to go to the labs or they're not getting to do that volunteer work or they're not getting to to experience uh, some of the of the foundational aspects for their future professional life. This learning how to work on teams, this learning how to, to give in or to negotiate, or it's part of the critical thinking skills that you need others. And it's sometimes easier to do it in person than doing it through a Zoom screen. So I think there is definitely a loss. There's definitely a loss. And some communities are, are experiencing a deeper loss than others because of the lack of resources. I was going to ask what you meant by that. I'm, what I mentioned in a moment, so there may be a family, for example, that there's five people at home and they all are competing with a one laptop available for everybody and their internet connection is weak or they can't afford that internet connection that month because a parent lost their job. So that's difficult then or students that are applying for medical schools or other places that they may not have a place where they can lock a door and be by themselves when they have three siblings playing around, or the parents working from home as well. So 
and you can't really go to the library right now to do that kind of one space. So there's structural inequities in everything, and and in this period, they're no different. Perhaps they're even more exacerbated. Is there an ability, for example, I know, as you said, you advise uh, students who hope to go to medical school. Are they able to travel to these uh, schools to interview and things like that? No, all that is virtual. All the interviews have been virtual, and there have been no tools added to the interview process for medical school in which you pre-record part of what you're saying and that goes in. And, you know, some of us are more comfortable looking into a camera or speaking into a microphone. And, you know, the 19 and the 20 and the 21 year old is not necessarily as comfortable as we may be. And it's harder to read social cues and other physical signs of how you're doing in an interview if you don't have the person in front of you. So we have adapted many of our services to this platform precisely to work with them and to help them develop those skills. So look at the camera. Uh, Don't be reading on the other screen. Make sure everything is turned off. So a new set of skill sets that we are trying to help them build. It seems as though just one thing layered on top of another at this point. Absolutely. And there are very few good things adding up at this point. So now we're, we're managing the, the return to campus and now we have more students on campus than we did last quarter. So as we work with them from a public health perspective, trying to build a culture of health among youngsters that may just be so excited to be on campus and away from parents that they may throw caution to the wind. So how do you enforce and continue to recommend safer behaviors? when nobody really wants. That's why I said that we're the bad news people. So make sure you wear your mask, make sure you're six feet away, but I want to have a party with my friends. Yes, but this is why you shouldn't. <laughs> so all those messages still need to go out and it's it's not what they want to hear. No, and certainly not from us. So we've been working with, uh, with peer educators on campus to try to distribute that message, you know, basic diffusion of innovation theory and this kind of of approach of peer-led education, which is uh, perhaps better received than when the old balding person comes around and says, don't do this, don't do that. It's easier to hear it from a friend, from a peer. And we're hoping to build a culture of health for them. What do you think the long-term impact will be on these kids that you talk to? I think they are maturing in ways they don't even know they are. The circumstances have pushed them to to grow up a little faster, perhaps. And I'm, I'm not sure if I can say that that's a good thing, but it's like generations that live through natural disasters or war or other things are forced to grow a little faster. And we're living through a battlefield in many ways right now. So I hope that they will. we will all come out of this with a deeper understanding of the importance of, uh, of equity the importance of ensuring that people have access to education, to prevention services, and to health services, that they will be good critical thinkers and they will embrace a role as future activists. And in my book, activism is a good word. And I I don't need them to go chain themselves up to a fence like we did during the HIV pandemic, but I want them to be able and willing to speak up and to say this is not right. And I want them to be able to articulate the importance of racist practices on the on pandemics and on educational practices. I mean, we did a session not too long ago with uh, white coats for black lives, for example, which I think is very important that when students go into this uh, educational programs, they know they're allies and we that we all have an obligation to partake in resolving the structural inequities that continue to saddle us. Jose Ramon Fernandez Pena, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.